yellow for you can start okay ma'am good morning everybody i am ansha nilofer the head of the physics department and i hajra women's college malapalayam it's my immense pleasure to welcome you all for this auspicious occasion let me first thank our almighty allah who is most merciful and most beneficent and who guides ourselves to arrange such a wonderful sessions and i would like to thank our management people that's our president engineer sk sayed ahmed sir and secretary engineer sk guda muhammad sir for their valuable support for arranging this wonderful webinar i would like to extend my warm welcome to our respected principal dr k rajab fatima who gave a constant encouragement for organizing this grateful webinar namely e series lecture 2 arranged by anne hajra women's college malapalayam in collaboration with edus x the learning people in which we are going to enrich our knowledge in the topic of emerging solar cell materials and characterization and on behalf of our management i welcome the honorable invited speakers dr x sahaya sajan director academics and research psn college of engineering and technology and dr em moti associate professor center for Re scientific and applied research psn college of engineering and technology tirunelveli welcome you both of you sir and i extend my warm welcome to all the panelists and organizing committee members and faculty members and research scholars from various institutions i welcome you all the participants and i welcome everybody once again now i would like to invite our respected principal to deliver her presidential speech over to you ma'am thank you <clears throat> in the name of allah the most gracious and most merciful as we all know education is art of cultivating hopeful environment and relationship for learning it's often said that we are learning all the time and it happens every time learning is both a process and an outcome thus it is paved way for these types of webinar in times of pandemic also so in this regard i am proud and glad that we have eminent personalities like dr x sahaya shajan director academics and research from ps and college of uh, tech engineering and technology and dr em moti associate professor center for scientific and applied research ps and college of engineering and technology we are really grateful to you sir for having accepted our invitation to provide a e series of your lectures on these webinars to our college uh, in association with our college i would also like to pay my indebtedness to the management for their wholehearted support which they give for the betterment of the students staff and for the college and i also congratulate the hod of the department of physics mrs nilofa and the organizing committee members dr shri devi and dr lavanya and others for their support in organizing this webinar and also my appreciation to my computer science department staff mrs bhuma and mrs mumtaz begum for the technical support extended to me in organizing these webinars thank you and i once again welcome all those who are on screen and for all the participants who are here thank you thank you very much over to shri devi Sri Devi, you can carry on. Ma'am, Sri Devi, ma'am is not here.
I think she has some internet connection fault. Yes, ma, she is in. Yeah, now she is joining. Yeah. Go over to Sri Devi. Sri Devi, ma'am, unmute yourself. Okay, ma'am. Start. Good morning to all present here. I'm happy to introduce our today's first speaker, Dr. Sahaya Shajan. He was graduated in physics from Madurai Kamaraj University and got his post graduation from Bharadarsan University, Trichirapalli. He was awarded PhD in physics by Manamaniam Sundaranar University. His area of research includes crystal growth, nanostructure, and composite materials for energy applications. He has handled many research projects funded by national funding agencies to a tune of rupees 2.5 crores. To his credit, he has published more than 70 research papers in refereed international journals of high impact. So far, 12 scholars have completed, successfully completed their PhD degrees under his guidance. He has organized 14 national and international conferences, student internship programs, workshops. He is a life member of Material Research Society of India, Photonic Society of India, Indian Association for Crystal Growth and Indian Society for Technical Education. Currently, he is serving as a director, academics and research at PSM College of Engineering and Technology. We are happy to have you, sir. I request you to take over the session. Over to Shajan, sir. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you for your nice introduction. So, can I start my presentation now? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Hope you can see my slides. Yes, sir. Yes. So today my topic is on metal organic framework aerosol composites, an emerging family of fibrin nanomaterials for energy applications. And uh, Ramo Zubu and Alvin are my students, PhD students who have successfully completed. And this is our campus. <clears throat> so my presentation will cover all these five topics that I will be briefing about the renewable energy sources. Then I will be talking about the solar energy and solar cells. Then porous materials. Then about metal organic framework and aerogel composites, usually called as MOFACs. Then I will be discussing my our experiments with MOFAC as the photoanode. So if you see the MNRE report published in December 2019, the cumulative installed power capacity in India is given here. And if you see from this region, from hydro to solar, we call as the renewable energy source, energy generated from renewable energy source. And of course, these are all non-renewable. And the projection for 2029-30 is also given here. If you see, there is a huge increase in the production of solar energy in the next 10 years. Almost it is a fourfold increase in the energy production. And that's why everywhere the solar energy is now coming very, very important. But this is not an Indian scenario. If you see the entire world scenario also, you can see by 2035, the solar energy will find to have an increase in the production of solar energy. There is a very a steep increase, a huge increase in the production of solar energy. And you can see by other renewable energy sources, solar and wind are going very high. And that's why the discussion on solar energy becomes very, very important. And why we need this solar energy? And what is its importance that we have to see? Say, so first of all, solar energy is available free of cost. 
it is a renewable energy source and you know it is an eco friendly has no environmental hazards and the most important is the energy received from sun is enormous the huge amount of energy is being received every day from the sun if you calculate the energy received the total energy that is coming out of the sun is 179 petawatts and you know 1 petawatt is 10 power 15 watts and approximately 29% of the energy coming from the sun is being reflected by the atmosphere and nearly 21% is being absorbed by the atmosphere so we will be losing around 50% of the total solar energy that is coming from the sun and the remaining energy is being absorbed here of the remaining energy absorbed here you know the earth is made up of two third of water is the earth and one third of land is available therefore we will be finally getting around 32 to 35 peta watt of energy from sun when you compare this amount of energy with the energy that is being used by the entire world which is of the order of terawatts it is 10 power 12 watts whereas this is a peta watt still it is very very high but how we are going to harvest this 30 to 35 peta watt of energy that is useful for our applications and that is very very important whether we are able to harvest all the 30 to 35 peta watt of energy that is the task in the solar energy harvesting this all physics you know this is a black body radiation spectrum and you know planck's black body planck's law says that as wavelength increases the shift that there is a shift in the peak of the maximum spectral uh, sorry uh, the wavelength and that wavelength gets shifted towards the lower wavelength as we increase the temperature so 4000 it is here for 6000 goes below, below 500 nanometers and the temperature of the sun is around 6000 kelvin so this peak corresponds to the the black body radiation of the sun because we know sun is considered as a black body which is continuously emitting radiation and if you compare this spectrum of the sun which we call the black body radiation at the temperature of the sun we find that the entire visible region is covered under the spectrum that is the importance of the solar energy of course it has the uv radiation and also a significant amount of ir radiation that is the heat radiations so that is there but if you see the entire visible region is covered by the sun's radiation so we are able to harvest the complete solar energy which is in the visible region so this is the second important reason why solar energy is preferred the device which converts light energy into electrical energy that is solar energy into electrical energy is what you called as solar cell and solar cell functions in the form in the, uh, the principle of photovoltaic effect which is creation of voltage and electric current in a material not all materials the specific materials upon exposure to light and it is a combination of both physical and chemical properties and photovoltaic effect was discovered in the year 1839 by edmund becquerel he is the father of henry becquerel who later discovered radioactivity so he discovered this effect in 1839 now solar cells let us see as simple how it works and what is the main uh, events that to be that to that should occur in order to a solar cell to convert light energy into electrical energy three processes are very very important one is absorption of light and consequently generation of charge carriers so absorption and generation then the generated charge carriers has to be separated that is the second process what you call the separation of charge carriers and the separated charge carriers should be collected at the electrodes so that an electric current is coming therefore the third process is collection 
so absorption generation that is together and separation and collection these three processes are common for a photovoltaic effect to happen and this is common for all solar cells whatever it is whether it is a silicon solar cell or a disensitized solar cells or an organic solar cells these three processes has to happen so this is where this is a common solar cell that you might have seen everywhere it is being installed and it is a silicon solar cell made up of silica and this is being a commercially available solar cells which are installed in almost all areas throughout the world and why silicon why silicon is preferred but silicon is the second most abundant element on earth so it can be easily obtained and the production of high quality crystalline silicon is a well established process the technology is well established so how much whatever be the quantity we require we can easily produce a high quality crystalline silicon and the third important category third important property is it has good electronic semiconductor properties which are favorable for photovoltaic conversion so its band gap is around 1.12 electron volt at room temperature and it absorbs the entire visible spectrum so these are the very very important properties of silicon why silicon has found such a huge application in solar cells and silica is nothing but sand so that you know everywhere we can find sand that is why i said is the second most abundant material in the earth and silica is obtained in the form of sio2 which we call as silicon dioxide and when we add carbon to it by a process it is a chemical process which is a well established process of course it involves high temperature and everything and we can convert this silica it is a sand into a silicon but silica as such it is not a good conductor because you know it is a semiconducting material so the motion of electrons in a semiconductor will be in a random way therefore we cannot use that silicon as such therefore what we do as physics students you know we make n type semiconductor as well as p type semiconductor by adding a trivalent impurity or a pentavalent impurity so that accordingly we get this is a pentavalent therefore this is a trivalent boron and lead and we are getting an n type semiconductor and p type semiconductor and subsequently we are uh, making a p n junction and you know i don't want to go into the detail because these are our fundamentals and in a pn junction we will be getting a depletion region across the junction and a voltage barrier is formed and we say this is the barrier potential and this is the normal conditions this is the normal conditions now in such a p type and n type combined a pn junction a depletion layer is here now if sunlight strikes the depletion region now charge carriers are being generated in the depletion region and already there is a potential on either sides so one side is positive and another side is negative therefore the holes are attracted towards the negative side and the electrons are attracted towards the positive side and hence a charge gradient is formed uh, or what you call excess of charges are available in the n side and the p side and due to this a potential difference is being created across the solar cells now if i connect a load outside these electrons will move in the external circuit and recombine with the holes in the p side and this is a continuous process as long as the sunlight is available and this is how our silicon solar cell works so everything is fine then why we want to go for other type of solar cells that is a question so if you see for everything there is a limit and similarly for silicon photovoltaics or silicon solar cells there is a limit and what is the limit that is the maximum efficiency that can be obtained that is a theoretical value is around 29.4% around 30% 29.4% it is the maximum efficiency beyond that we cannot in increase the efficiency of a silicon solar cells and what now we are getting we have recorded up to 23.6 we have come up to this level 23.6% has been already 
available and of course we are losing 73.7 percent as in the form of recombination and other effects that we will be discussing later so we have already reached to a maximum that is around uh, we are nearing now now the available efficiency in silicon solar cells is around 27 percent which is very close to this 29.4 percent and that is the reason why we are going for other materials whether we can improve the efficiency beyond this 29.4 that is one reason second reason there are also several materials which are even able to give more efficiency than silicon solar cells but the problem here is silicon solar cell technology is a well established because it is there for several almost 60 years they are working on this silicon solar cells and say about the technology of uh, separating silica, silicon from silica as well as purifying silicon is all well established several industries are there in the entire world but it's not like for it's not uh, like that for other materials where such technology such purification processes is not so much available so these are the different types of solar cells which are other than silicon solar cells which is being widely studied all over the world and of course dye sensitized solar cells is one of the oldest because it was first reported in 1991 by, by Gretzel and others uh, which has been here for the, uh, research for the past 30 years and still it is going on so now today my talk will be around this dye sensitized solar cells that our experiments what we are conducted and the materials what we have identified i will be talking on one side and uh, dr moti will be doing on the other side now let us see how the dye sensitized solar cell works so it has one uh, substrate that is a glass substrate or what you call the fluorinated tin oxide it is a tin uh, conducting tin oxides we normally we call the tcos that is light can be transmitted is like, just like a glass slide in which uh, fluorinated tin will be coated and we call that as an anode and above this we coat the titanium dioxide and above that we coat the dye and these the titanium oxide and the fto together we call that as a photo anode because it is related with the light that is why it is called a photo anode and above that a dye is coated then an electrolyte is being placed above that which contains the redox is a reduction oxidation couple that we call as a redox so it is a redox couple iodine iodide couple then we have another fto in which platinum is coated that is platinum you know it's a very good conductor of electricity and uh, that we call as a cathode so this is the structure of a dye sensitized solar cells and this is connected to the external load load may be an electric bulb or anything you can connect to an external source now when sunlight falls on the dye the dye gets sensitized therefore you know it goes to the excited state so this excited electron is injected into the conduction band of the titanium dioxide and this uh, injected electron is now diffused into the external circuit and this electron goes round the entire circuit and comes back and comes back to the first position by the time this redox couple would have given uh, generated an electron and that is being transferred this is for electron transfer so all these process in the entire process is happening and we are able to make the light to ignite so talking is very simple we ask we can say that uh, this is uh, exciting this is giving the electron to the conduction band and this electron goes around and we are getting electricity everything is over everything we can talk it's very simple but when we come to the process practical process it is a very very difficult process because you know there is a photo excitation taking place here a photo excitation then an injection of the electron to the conduction band then diffusion of this one is happening then at the same time a recombination may happen at the same time the dye has to be regenerated by the uh, couple uh, redox electrolyte through the electrolyte it is there and also you see the titanium dioxide is over the FTO and immediately above that the dye is there immediately above the electrolyte is there so everything are interconnected so instead of electron diffusing into here the electron may come back to the dye itself so several photophysical prop, uh, events that are happening 
inside the uh, inside the dye sensitized solar cells so if you see these are the various photophysical events we are we call that as a very ultra fast fast as well as ultra fast why it so it is a combination of several processes and if you see the time one is happening in a millisecond and another is happening in a femtosecond millisecond you know it is 10 power minus 3 whereas femtosecond is 10 power minus 15 and another one is happening in a microsecond another one is happening in a picosecond so you see all these are happening between 10 power minus 3 to 10 power minus 15 10 power minus 15 it is a very very fast and that is why we call it as an ultra fast and this is of course a fast process of course for a for an electron this is a dead slow process what you call a millisecond for us this is a very 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 fast for an electron this is the slowest to process what is happening even a microsecond process and millisecond process is simply a process for the electron so this is the combination and you can see now you see here this is the process one this electron is being excited and this is being injected into the conduction bag and that is being diffusing into the anode this is the straight process what we are discussing but at the same time they it may come back to this original position that is what you called the excited molecule excited electron coming to its ground state and it will recombine with the ground state this is one possibility or the excited that uh, electron from the dye has not is not acquired sufficient energy to reach the conduction band that it can come back to its original ground state and another degeneration is happening here that is the dye gener dye degeneration so all these these process that is photo excitation is happening is so everything is happening at the same moment electro photo excitation electron injection electron diffusion dye regeneration and electron recombination all these things almost seven photophysical events are happening in a dye sensitized solar cells that is the major problem in controlling the electron movement or to trap the electron for conduction And so that we get electricity out of this dye sensitized solar cells that is the point where so many scientists are working on different type of materials to stop the recombination rate to stop uh, to improve the electron injection rate and diffusion rate in that way we are working so dyes another thing is the dyes what is advantage of dyes is it is sensitized both by natural as well as artificial light sources so artificial light sources means a dye sensitized solar cells can be kept below a fluorescent lamp that is a tube light what is available in our room you can keep the dye sensitized solar cells below that and it will be sensitized but it is not so in the case of a silicon solar cell so that is a major advantage because then it is very clear that it can be applied for indoor applications so you can have this type of solar cells are now being available that is you can there is a company in japan which is producing for so many solar cells it is just like in the size of your tablet computer uh, your tablet that is you are using so you can uh, put it in your table and you connect your uh, light source and it will be burning such type of applications there are there but still lot of work is going also a dye sensitized solar cells essentially has these four uh parts a photo anode a dye and electrolyte and a counter electrode which i have explained already earlier and i will be talking on this photo anode materials and our uh, my fellow colleague my friend dr moti will be speaking on the dyes and all these other characterization methods so porous materials uh, you might have heard about these porous materials and that are broadly classified into there are several classifications that is being reported in literature but for our sake we are taking this classification as micro porous materials meso porous materials and macro porous materials so micro porous materials in which the pore diameter the pore diameter should be less than 2 nanometers in the case of a meso porous material the pore diameter should be around 2 to 50 nanometers and in a macro porous material the diameter should be greater than 50 nanometers this is a general classification so for example if you take a micro porous material we can say metal organic frameworks which we are going to discuss today or zero gels that is another type of material so these are classified examples 
for micropores and for mesopores we are having mcm that is a mobile mobile company mobil you have heard about it mobile composite materials they have created one specific type of porous material which is called which is having a diameter around 10 nanometers and that is called mcm41 and another one is aerogels which we will be discussing today and the macro porous material the common example is this sponge and there is another class of materials what we called as multimodal porous material the name itself multimodal because it has more than one modes of porous and we can see about that so materials that contain multimodal interconnected pores so it will be having the combination of a micro or a macro or a meso or a macro or a micro or a meso like that it is a combination and we say that is a composite materials because it is a, is a combination of uh, two domain two materials with multiple phases and of course it should be a continuous phase and is a non gaseous phase of course it is a solid and uh, i according to ipac you can say this i uh, uh, nano composite to be a material in which either one of the phases should be in nanometers and here the two are in nanometers therefore it is a nano composite material that is a multimodal and multimodal as i told you it is having two types it is bimodal as well as multimodal if two things are combined then we say it is a bimodal actually micro micro or macro meso or micro meso uh, macro or if it is a multimodal if all the three is are combined together so that material will contain its pores of all the three categories as we discussed earlier it is containing Uh, some uh, pores will be of having diameter around 2 nanometers and some will be having around say 10 to 20 nanometers and something will be having more than 50 nanometers all the three will be present and it will be in a continuous phase <coughs> and uh, it is also referred in the literature as a hierarchical multimodal uh, materials in the combining of two materials having two different pore structures this is what we are going to discuss today and multimodal porous materials are not new ones say so they are available in the nature and uh, and they perform multiple functions with enhanced properties and one the very uh, important material that is available is your bone the bone available in your body is a multimodal porous material which contains different different type of porous materials in it and uh, one you say this cortical hard bone that is on the surface of your bone is a microporous and this is a mesoporous that is uh, trabecular uh, bone is a combination of mesoporous and macroporous and this is very compact that is why when we when it is hit by anything you will get a fracture it is highly brittle whereas this is not brittle this has more strength than the uh, cortical bone so a fracture happens on the cortical bone and not only the bones and the here we can see lot of natural naturally available available materials that are available in the nature which are made up of this bimodal or multimodal materials and coming to our materials our work we have two classes of nanostructured porous material that is aerogels and metal organic frameworks and this is what we are mixing these aerogels and metal organic frameworks a lot of work has been done on metal metal organic frameworks by most of the chemistry labs in the world and of course aerogels also they have done a lot of work but combining these two is somewhat a new one for energy applications so aerogels are first reported in the year 1932 by kistler where we have to replace the gel that uh, sorry liquid in the gel without collapsing its porous structure we have the reason is suppose you are having you know a volume you know you just take a cube which is which is heavy which is hollow in the center now you have to remove the entire liquid without reducing the volume of the cube that is very very important normally we will we can crush it and we can uh, remove it or we can heat the material and we can remove the liquid present in but in all these cases the structure will be collapsed and the volume will be decreased but in the aerogel 
it should not be decreased. The solvent has to be taken off. And we can see in detail. And metal organic frameworks is another type of the porous polymers. And that is being reported long back in 1965. But the work of Omar Aggi and his co workers in 1999 put MOF into the limelight. And after that, a lot of work has been carried out mainly on catalysis. A lot of chemistry processes are working on this catalysis. A lot of work is there. Now it is not a new one, but a lot of work is going on on this metal organic frameworks all over the world. And why these two materials, both MOFs and aerogels, I have said it's a porous classification of porous materials and as well as nanostructure. And therefore, they have high surface area. If you say aerogels will have the surface area around 300 meters squared per gram. If you take one gram of the material, the surface area will be around 300 meters squared. Whereas in MOF, it is still high. It will be coming around 800 to 1000 meters squared. High porous volumes. And then it has high porosities. Low density. It is very lightweight. And the very important one is the pore tunability. The pore tunability means if I want to have 10 nanometer pores, I can tune it accordingly. Suppose I want to improve the pore size or I want to decrease the pore, pore diameter, I can do it. That is why according to your application, you can modify the synthetical procedures or you can do some modifications on the material and you can tune the pores that will be uh, suitable for your applications. These are the advantages what we have in MOFs and aerogels. So incorporating a micro and a mesoporous micro, that micro is a MOF and a mesoporous is an aerogel. So when we combine these two, we get a new material and that is what you call as MOF aerogel composites as abbreviated as MOF, sorry, MOFAX, MOF ACL, AC. And that is being widely you being experimented all over the world, and uh, you can see there are a lot of some of, most not a lot of work has been come up in this area, but very little work on energy applications. As I said, these MOFs are being tried extensively on catalysis and yes, absorption studies, absorption studies, not absorption, is absorption studies. And a lot of uh, work has been carried out in this area. And of course, very few work uh, in this area has been carried out in this work. <coughs> so now let us see what is an aerogel. Aerogels are nothing but, in other words, it is called aerogels because uh, in the gel, you remove the liquid and in the place of the liquid, you are keeping the air. So this is a 3D interconnected network structure possessing high surface area, high optical transparency. All light will can pass through because most of the areas are empty and it has a very low density, very, very low density. So I have already told you, and this is why this is in this way you can create a gel. So gel will contain the solid network as well as the liquid in it. Now I want to remove the liquid out of it without disturbing the volume. So same volume you are getting here. If you destroy the volume, then it is called a zero gel. That is a different case. So from a solid, you remove the liquid and re retain the structure of the solid as such. And then we call this is an aerogel. And if it is filled with water, we call it as an hydrogel or with an alcohol, we call it as an alcohol. And if it is filled with an air, that is nothing is present, no solvent or liquid, anything is present, then we call it as an aerogel. And if you see the physical properties of these aerogels, it is, as I said, it is a very, very low density, very, very low density. And skeletal density is also very, very low. And we see the porosity, it is almost 80 to 99% is completely porous so that it can absorb anything. And the average pore diameter, you can have 20 to 150 and the surface area, you can tune the surface area as well as the pore uh, diameter and it is ranging. All these are reported in the literatures and its thermal conductivity is very low. That is why it can be, it can be used as an insulating material. 
So the common method of preparing uh, aerogel is by a sol gel method. It is a common method that is most of the researchers will know what is a sol gel. You have to prepare a sol and then you have to make an we allow for aging, make to condense and convert that into a gel. So the sol is being converted into a gel by, by taking some days. And most of the people are working on this sol gel. It's a well established uh, procedure. Now the main important thing is how to remove the liquid that is present inside the pore. That is a major uh, problem. Major problem in the sense we, we should not destroy the structure. We have to retain the structure at the same time we have to take the liquid or the solvent that is present here. And you know this is the formula that is relating the uh, capillary pressure and the pore diameter. And you know if the pore diameter is less, the pressure will be more and if the pore diameter is large, the pressure will be less. So we have to see that if you increase the pressure, this will break. The walls of the material will break and it is completely collapsing. It should not happen. Therefore, we have to retain. We should be very careful while removing this. So here you know this gamma is the surface tension that is uh, that is there between the liquid and the surface, and of course cos theta is the interfacial interfacial angle, and all these you know you as physics students you know all these things. So the only factor which I can uh, use here is the uh, interfacial surface tension. So if I can reduce the interfacial surface tension, then automatically I am reducing the capillary pressure. So in that case, uh, you, can, you have to retain the uh, pore diameter. You should not disturb this. So only one thing is you have to play with this one. This interfacial surface tension and automatically pore diameter will reduce. Sorry, uh, pore uh, capillary pressure will reduce. Now how we are doing? That is very important thing that we have to do. There are three dry, drying technique methods are available. One is called a supercritical drying, another one you call freeze drying, and another one you call as a subcritical drying. In a supercritical drying, you take that wet gel, put into an autoclave, and you increase the temperature and pressure to its critical point. That is critical temperature and critical pressure, usually normally very high. So if you take this uh, pressure, this is the temperature pressure graph, and if you take this to this point, that is a critical point, it's a point at which the liquid is converted into a fluid. You know, a liquid, a fluid will have no surface tension. Surface tension is equal to zero, so it can easily flow out. So on the liquid or the solvent that is present inside the pores of the gel will be taken away. This is a very good method. And of course, uh, we can say it's a perfect method to convert, to prepare aerogels. But the one the major problem is, so we are playing, we are increasing, or we are playing at the tem critical temperature and critical pressure, which is normally very high. So the autoclave in which the, uh, the autoclave should be closed properly, there should not be any leak and the autoclave should be capable of handling such a very high temperature and pressure. In other case, this will burst. And that, uh, that type of accidents have happened in many places in the world, but still that is the one of the best method to prepare the uh, aerogel or to remove the uh, solvent that is present inside the pores. The second method is the freeze drying method. Here, just opposite that you have to uh, lower the temperature. Excuse me. We have to lower the temperature below the freezing point. And also, simultaneously, you have to keep the pressure below the sublimation. That is, both are important. So, this is also an industrial process, like uh, previous one, that is, supercritical method. The freezing drying is also done in many uh, industries for production of bulk amount of aerogels. So you have reduced this one, reduce the freezing point, 
uh, sorry, reduce the temperature below the freezing point and pressure below the sublimation pressure. Since it is being done at a very low temperature, this type of gels are usually referred to as cryogels also. But here, there is one you should be very careful as there the temperature is a uh, major is a, what you can you take a precaution on working on high temperatures in the freezing you have to take uh, precaution that is since you are going below the freezing point sometimes crystal growth may occur inside the pores because suppose you say if the solvent is water then you are going below uh, you are coming to the zero point then freezing takes place and if the crystal growth is being uh, produced or the crystal growth is initiated inside the pores now what happens is uh, you know when water is converted into ice its volume increases or density decreases especially volume decreases and expansion has happening in freezing and what happens is your mesopores now becomes macropores because due to the expansion of water while freezing this becomes a macropore so you are expecting a mesopore but you will be ending with a macropore so that you have to take care of and also there we can combine the solvent exchange also here and supercritical method and freezing drying method or industrial process where we can produce bulk and the third method method is a subcritical drying method which is a simple method but uh, maybe it is a somewhat time consuming method too and we cannot produce uh, in bulk production of aerogels but uh, is a lab scale method lab scale we can use it it's a lab la laboratory process is a very good method here what we do is we take the gel and we take another solvent say for example if i am using water as a solvent you know the surface tension of water is around 0.7 so i want to choose now another solvent which is having surface tension less than 0.7 normally most of the organic solvents will have their surface tension less than 0.7 around 0.3 0.2 even 0.1 exane will have around 0.7 sorry 0.1 and uh, isopropyl alcohol will have around 0.2 so such type of solvents you can choose so what you do you prepare the gel you put it inside uh, the uh, beaker or something some vessel containing the n hexane or isopropyl alcohol you exchange the solvent this is very similar to the method what we use in your house to wash your clothes if you want to remove the dirt that is on the clothes what you do you apply soap and what soap does the soap reduces the surface tension and automatically the dirt is removed in a similar way you are reducing the surface tension of the uh, water or any 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 a solvent you can take the thing is the surface tension of the the surface tension of the solvent that is you are using uh, sorry the liquid that you are using to extract the solvent should have the surface tension less than the solvent that is the case that is that you have to decide so if you are continuously doing like that all the liquid which is having higher surface tension will be slowly removed out of the pores the thing is this cannot be done in a single stage you have to repeat and repeat for several times and finally that by trial and error method you can find how many times in our case we did for six times so sometimes if you have to go up to 10 times you have to do this process and totally you can remove the pores but one problem here some residues may be present because you may remove the solvent but the uh, the liquid that you are using to remove the solvent that residue sometimes may be present there it may be certain cases it's beneficial and some certain times it may be not beneficial that we have to find it so all these optimizations we have to do after that you can simply dry uh, around say some 100 degrees centigrade or something because all organic solvents will evaporate in a, around 40 degrees centigrade so all these will go away and you will get the aerogel mof is a very is a simple solvo thermal process is normally used you have to take a solution which is containing some solvent maybe in water or a dmf uh, this is an organic solvent you put here inside the salt as well as the organic ligand 
and they will combine just like a structure you will get now as i was told earlier you have to do a solvent exchange heat in a vacuum and now you get all the solvents are removed and you will be getting a network structure like this and this is called a metal organic frameworks both are the preparatory methods are both are same this is here we are using a simple solver thermal there we are using a solger once uh, aerogel is prepared and uh, uh, mof is prepared now we have to mix this two to get an mofac that is the metal organic framework aerogel composites so far three methods are available one is you call the direct mixing another is the in situ mof synthesis and third one is physical mixing in the direct mixing method is a simple method so we have to add say we can take the liquid precursors what are needed for preparing the aerogel you take it then you add the mof to this then you prepare the sol or you can add the mof in this stage also once sol is prepared you can add the mof in both way you can do now you will have a sol mof suspension then you gelate it by condense it by using the gelation procedures then you will get an hydrogel then you can dry it you remove the liquid that is inside and now you will be getting this mof aerogel composites so this is the simple procedure that in any lab you can do it but the thing is uh, some important basic considerations you have to see what is uh, there should not be any concentration gradient while you are adding the mof to the salt what it what i mean is suppose if there is a uh, concentration gradient then immediately the agglomeration takes place that is mof will agglomerate on one side and your aerogel will be agglom agglomerating on other side and you will not be getting an mofac instead of two materials you will get so that is one case how to avoid this so when we are start adding the mof you have to constantly stir stir the liquid for say 6 hours 7 hours you have to stir the entire solution then you have to allow it for condensation otherwise agglomeration will happen this point number 1 second one is the compatibility of the solvent that you are using suppose in that solvent if the mof dissolves is easily soluble in a solvent that you have chosen for the preparation of the aerogel so aerogel will be obtained but mof mof is easily soluble in that solvent so then the mof structure is totally collapsed it becomes solved it is dissolved into the solution so compatibility is very very important that mof should be stable in the solvent what you have taken and the third one is the this electrophilic and nucleophilic uh, concepts that is so suppose you are using water water uh, i think it's a nucleophilic yes it's a nucleophilic and this is an electrophilic so one will donate an electron another one is ready to accept the electron if you are choosing in such a way if mof is electrophilic and the water is say a solvent is nucleophilic then mof and water begin to start to react and they will exchange the electron and new compound will be formed so all these three things you have to be careful when we are doing a direct mixing so this is the important precautions here so before starting that one you have to check whether your mof is water soluble whether you are using water in your uh, precursors as or your water as a solvent in your uh, aerogel synthesis all these things you have to check and you should be very confident that in nothing the mof is not being disturbed while adding to this one the second one is in situ mof mo this mofac synthesis Yeah, this is also called as a ship in a bottle approach say where the uh, <coughs> mof is called the ship and the aerogel is called the bottle here is nothing but uh, you are synthesizing the mof uh, sorry you synthesize the aerogel and in the pour you add the pre precursors for the mof you can see in this picture you can understand so aerogel is here now you add the metal precursors to it then you add the organic linker to it now the reaction is taking place that is the the formation of mof is happening inside the pores of the aerogel now you dry and you can form the composite now here also you have to be very careful because 
you are doing the process inside the aerogel itself in the pores of the aerogel itself now what is the problem is the one thing is the aerogel sorry mof should be strongly bound to the aerogel structure otherwise when you start washing on the final stage you will be doing some several stage of washing to remove the unwanted unreacted solvents to be coming out in such cases this mof if there is a very loose binding the mof will go off along with the water the second thing is uh, mof also will have some functional groups and your gels will also have some functional groups and these functional groups uh, may make a link because you are adding an organic link instead of it is linking with the metal ion that uh, that is given in the pore it may link with the aerogel and some other compound will be formed so these two things you should be very careful when you are doing an in situ mofax synthesis and the third one and this is an image that uh, is in situ uh, mofax synthesis this is a chitin nanofiber in which copper btc that is uh, btc is benzene tricarboxylic acid uh, so this is a mof copper btc is an mof which is being seen inside the fiber and the third one is the physical mixing method that two the mof is taken separately and the aerogels are taken separately both are put together and they are crushed and ground and made into a single material and this method is very simple here the, there is no compatibility problem comes in and uh, the synthetical procedures are very simple and you need not worry about whether it is a water soluble mio for anything the nucleophilic concept or a electrophilic concept nothing comes in you have to put your prepare both separately put it into a uh, crusher you crush it ground it and your thing is ready and this is also advantages in getting high surface area because in that cases as you see in later in my now experiments i will explain later sometimes we will be losing the surface area of aerogel will be having a high surface area and when i add the mof it will reduce the surface area in certain cases but all these drawbacks will be overcome in physical mix mixing method and one example is carbon aerogel with copper btc uh, you are able to get around 1236 meter squared whereas the same thing when we prepared in in situ synthesis we are able to get only 923 meter squared per gram and the same thing the volume <coughs> there is no mesopore volume reductions uh, is happening in the physical mixing method so these are the many applications that are being reported and uh, Uh, our work is mainly on solar cells as well as super capacitors we have worked on this and now today i am going to present my final portion of my talk is on nickel btc mof titanium aerogel aero composite this is our experiments on photo anode in dye sensitized solar cells so the first part what you call the stabilization titanium we want to get titanium isopropoxide so it is highly unstable so we have to stabilize this with acetic acid then we do an hydrolysis uh, with the deionized uh, water and you know the ratio is 1 is to 10 is to 350 this is in the ratio we are using the acetic acid water and titanium isopropoxide and then that is the point where we are getting the sol and that is being condensed by passing ammonia so we are adjusting the ph of the solution suitable for condensation we want to convert into a gel and we are allowing it for aging for about 24 hours at 70 degree centigrade now we are able to get a gel and this gel is being solvent exchange as i already told you we are using n hexane isopropyl alcohol to reduce the uh, surface tension because we are using water here so these two are having surface tension less than water so we are using the solvent exchange for six times and the solvent is completely exchanged and then it is dried at room temperature around 30 35 degree centigrade and uh, we are getting the aerogel so for pre preparing this nickel mof uh, aerogel uh, composite you will be adding that uh, cop nickel btc at this point so when the solution is ready now this is uh, the is called a direct mixing method 
this is not either in situ or physical mixing this is direct mixing method so we are directly mixing the mof here so we have optimized other conditions and the mof what we have considered is water insoluble that is why we have no problem with the water that is being here and finally we are getting a powder like this so this is the powder like structure highly porous in nature and this is the powder we are get, getting after drying at room temperature and if you see the fsm uh, this is the fsm mh what of the aerogel what we have obtained is highly porous you can see it's highly porous like it's a beautiful flowery structure and you and if you see the uh, pore diameter using the bed surface you can calculate the pore diameter and if you see the pore diameter it is ranging between of course five around uh, eight nanometer to 30 nanometer it is spreading so the pores diameter is spreading from eight to 30 nanometer now to this aerogel we mixed the mof say 0.5 percent of nickel btc was added and you can see the difference the pores becomes uniformly distributed and is being reduced in size so this we can check in the bed surface you can check here almost the pores are distributed along 5 nanometers you can compare this two here there is a broad distribution from 5 to 30 uh, here it is closely distributed around 5 nanometers and you can see the image almost everything is having equal size of pores now you can check the surface area as well as bed curl isotherms you can check this is for aerogel this is the bed isotherm and when we add mof you can see there is a difference so it is nitrogen absorption desorption studies so you can see here it becomes robust it becomes more strong this is an indication this is a type 4 isotherm in the bed surface analysis and you can see the surface area for aerogel it is 252 meter squared per gram when we add 0.25 percent of mof it is 269 but it, then it comes reducing it is reducing below the pure one and you can see the surface roughness and the pore diameter, uh, mean pore diameter, you can see it is 23.2 as you seen earlier, it's, the mean diameter is very high, whereas it is being reduced, it is around 5 nanometers. One thing you should be very careful because for solar cell applications, your pore diameter should be around 5 to 20 nanometers, otherwise it won't work for this one. Now, why the surface area is decreasing in certain cases and why the surface area is increasing in certain cases, you can see that depends upon how the MOF is absorbed to the surface. If it is absorbing to the surface like this, this is the pore of the aerogel, sorry, this is the pore of the aerogel and if the MOF is, is uh, sitting on the surface, then automatically your surface area is increasing. So, surface area means it, everything is includes the pore pore diameter it goes inside the pores and if you sorry is calculating like this you are this one so the surface area increases if it goes and fills the pores then automatically your surface area is decreased so you can your surface area will be this one you cannot go inside the pore you, while calculating the pore uh, you are passing the nitrogen nitrogen will not go into these pores it will be uh, moving along these areas and that is why the surface area is decreasing it is not it is for nickel btc it is decreasing in our experiments we observed that when we use cobalt the surface area is increasing it is going beyond 300 so the, the reason is very clear that is nickel btc you know it is having an ionic radius very low whereas compared to cobalt cobalt ionic radius is large so it you cannot go inside the pore it is sitting on the surface now this is the image and you can see the detail hrtm image you can see a very good idea now this is the uh, structure what we have proposed and these are the arrow gels and uh, the blue color or the mof because we have added very small quantity so these are the blue colors we are seeing here these are the mof clusters and you can see that is being reflected on the hrtm image you can see the dark black portions of the mofs that what we have uh, added to the structure and the edax also being taken and the imaging was done on the, uh, what you call the electron imaging 
and you can see titanium is present oxygen is present nickel is present carbon that is the carboxylic acid the carbon is also present and if you see the xps results it is very clear uh, you can see the titanium remains it in its oxidation states as well as nickel and uh, this is the uh, uh, pristine titanium aerogel and this is the moif adder and you cannot see anything this nickel is being sorry the titanium aerogel is not disturbed by the addition to some to certain extent now if you see the xrd and uh, electron diffraction images you can see the difference so this is the for the pure aerogel that is being indexed here now i am adding 0.25% of uh, mof there is no major change is happening but when i go to 0.5% you can see some additional peaks are coming in and when i increase to 0.75% there is a significant change on broadening of the peak takes place and we have it is being identified that there is a phase change from anatase phase this is in the anatase phase of titania to the rutile and you know rutile is the most stable and uh, so when we start adding the mof to this the phase changes from anatase to rutile and that is being reflected in the electron diffraction images also you can see this is for pure titanium aerogel and you can see all the fringes as, uh, uh, are seen here corresponding to each reflection planes of the extra diffraction you can see the rings are seen here and if you are increasing that to 0.5% you can see the difference and if you still increase to 0.75% some of the uh, fringes are uh, missing here and it is showing something different so what we conclude the presence uh, when mof is added to the uh, aerogels there is a mixing of phases the anatase and rutile in the structure and you can see the crystalline size is around 3.5 to 3. nanometer and uh, the reduced crystallite size is beneficial for improving the contact between the fto and the tio2 substrate and uh, that is been supporting because later result shows that the resistance between resistant interfacial resistance is sorry series resistance is coming down and therefore there is a fast electron injection and this is the uh, uv spectra that is being obtained for this and you can see that for titania this is the titania aerogel this is the curve and the absorption is being somewhat increasing the for the other one and these are the bandwidth the bandwidth is getting decreased as we increase the mof value now how the photo anode is prepared we take the titania aerogel we use isopropyl alcohol we sonicate when we son spin coat the the this particular solution that is what you call what you call a slurry we spin coat on the surface of the fto then we calcinate at a temperature of 120 degrees centigrade for 30 minutes and we use the standard dye that is n719 of course we worked on porphyrins that uh, uh, professor modi will explain in this lecture and uh, n71 dye we have used here and the cathode is prepared by using platinic acid by thermal deposition on the fto substrate this is the solid electrolyte what we have prepared i don't i don't want to go into the detail and the cell area what we used is 0.5 cm square and n71 dye the formula is here and this is the formula what is there these are all standards there is no problem and in the polyethylene oxide that's a electrolyte as i already told you we have included the iodide salts along with that so that will be acting as the redox couple for electron transfer and uh, this polymer is a mixture of polyethylene on glycol and polyethylene oxide in the ratio of 60 to 40 and there is i i electrolyte is a separate area that i don't want to discuss here now is because in very elaborate and this is the setup what we have in our lab to measure the solar cell parameters it is called controlled intensity modulated photo electron spectrometer so it will having an uh, what do you call potential stats Uh, this is called uh, master uh, sorry master one and uh, this is called a slave one and this is giving in the iodine uh, 
uh, what you call adjusting the intensity of the light falling on the surface of the, the here actually you cannot see the uh, dye solar cells it is kept here when the light intensity is too much you cannot see it uh, so the light is falling on the cell and that is being connected to the master potential step so that it, everything is all uh, software based computer based so everything automatically recorded and all calculations will be taken up there and this is what is being recorded in the uh, sims and this is uh, the impedance spectra and this is the board plot and you can see at a close look you can see this is the close look you can see the resistance is decreasing for 0.5 uh, percentage of mof the interfacial resistance is decreasing and you see the board plots you can have the values here so for uh, aerogel it is 19.6 is ohms is the uh, resistance but when you come for 0.5 it is 17.8 so 0.5 percent of moi of nickel btc added to the aerogel is the most uh, favorable condition for solar cells in our findings and the very important thing we have found out here is the the electron lifetime that is very very important you see there is a significant increase in the electron lifetime uh, therefore the diffusion and as well as injection is quite possible that is reflected immediately you can see this is the dye absorb uh, dye absorption studies you can see uh, for aerogel uh, this is the reference and this for aerogel that is the lower this value for uh, 0.5 it is improving of course point fine point sanfa is improving but other factors are not supporting for uh, solar cell applications it may be used for some other applications and you can see the jv plot here you can see here this power conversion efficiency of the solar cell what we have fabricated is around 8.8 significant increase in the power conversion efficiency using solid electrolyte because solid electrolyte is being reported around 10 to 11% by using different methods in our case we have found, we have reached up to 8.8% in the this one this being reflected on the transient measurements what we have made and uh, by using the light pulses we have recorded the time versus photo current how the photo current responds to the time and you can see the photo current is very high for 0.5 percent it is very high and you can also see the decay of course i cannot see to show the enlarged one you can this one is it's taking more time to decay and these are the conditions which favor the uh, increase in the efficiency of the solar cells and you can see the energy level diagram this is the titanium dioxide is our band gap is around 3 to 3 3.1 around 3.0 this is the dye and these are the mofs and these are the band gaps we have seen in the UV absorption spectra, and you have calculated. So it is easily the diffusion is easily possible. In the if this becomes an intermediate step for the diffusion of electron, so that that is the reason why the efficiency is increased. And you can refer to my paper. This is our paper. Of course, Moti is also an author to this, and uh, we have published in Applied Surface Science. Uh, it's, it's our, it's just uh, five, five or six months back, it has been published, and you can go through this paper. You can get the, out of almost all the details what I have talked here. You get all the information in details. And also, a thankful to Science and Engineering Research Board of Department of Science and Technology because this project was done by the support of by their funding of nearly 25 lakhs funding is being supported. So thank you very much and. Uh, for giving this opportunity uh, thank you sir there is a, that uh, there is a question which uh, hmm. dr lavanya will ask you now which yeah. was asked by a participant yes yeah, sir sure. uh, good morning sir yes please ma'am uh, mr kulasekhar pandit have asked a uh, question uh, will the dye sensitivity solar cell contribute towards india's need for 2020 all i say energy requirement is uh, necessary for all purposes it is not dye sensitive solar cells wherever you are able to get uh, derive or harvest uh, energy from any source that is important it is not one solar energy it can be wind energy one thing is it should be a renewable energy source that is the point we have definitely it is going to contribute there is no doubt about it so another question is uh, 
those silicon based solar cells are contributing uh, 100% to society why do we con concentrate on dyson based solar cells with poor efficiency see it is a say always there is a quest for finding new materials for applications so many things are saturated but we are always going for alternate solutions in that way dye sensitized solar cells is also there and one advantage of this one is the uh, indoor applications which is uh, silicon solar cells cannot be possible with indoor applications this is possible with indoor applications so small small low current applications we can think of this one Okay, thank you, sir. And uh, another question for uh, the poster: uh, Is there any possibility to have efficient construction techniques of solar cell among other uh, or southern laboratories? Madam, please repeat. Uh, is there any possibility to have efficient construction techniques of solar cell among our southern laboratories? That, um, every, that, that everybody has to work to make the efficiency. to make a, build their own laboratories and find them it is possible everywhere it is not so like that we are also a college we are not a university we are we have built up our own facilities there you can visit our website also that is psnresearch.ac.in and you can see that the facilities what facilities we have and we are also allowing other uh, people to do their characterization but at present it is not possible uh, if needed you can contact us we will help thank you sir Uh, thank you very much sir